Okay, now this section is a little bit difficult because it has a lot of theorems, but the important point of this section is stated in the title. Non-singular matrices are invertible. In fact, this is an if and only if. Inverted matrices are non-singular. So if we want to cut to the chase, what's really important about this section is this list of equivalent conditions that we're adding to. All of these conditions are equivalent ways of saying the same thing. A, non, a matrix is non-singular. So think, see if you can identify with all of these properties. A matrix is non-singular if and only if it row reduces to the identity, if and only if the null space is trivial, if and only if the linear system LS of AB has a unique solution for every B. Now we can write that now as the system AX equals B. So AX equals B has a unique solution for any B. If and only if the columns of A are linearly independent, and now we can add if and only if A is invertible. Okay, so let's go back and look at these theorems. And uh, if you're pressed for time, you can come, come back and look at the, the proofs some other time. But that's the important summary of this section, what I just gave you. Now, this section is kind of a continuation of the section previous. We showed that if you have a non-singular matrix, you can compute a matrix J such that that non-singular matrix times J is the identity. So if you read this theorem here, CINM says, if you have a non-singular square matrix, you can find a matrix J that multiplies A on the right and gives the identity. So we can call J is a right inverse. It's a right inverse of A. So, sorry, it's not working very well. So, any non-singular matrix has a right inverse. Now we're going to complete this and show that any matrix A has an inverse that works on both sides. Remember, A times J is not necessarily the same thing as J times A. But that's what we're going to show, that this right inverse, in fact, turns out to be an inverse that works on both sides. A times J is equal to J times J A, which is equal to the identity. Now, before we get there, we need to prove some other things about non-singular matrices. And scroll back down. So we prove first this fact, which is called a lemma. And this theorem is motivated by something we know about real or complex numbers. If you have the product of two complex numbers and the product is non-zero, what do you know about the two individual factors? Well, you know the two individual factors can also be, are also non-zero. It's not possible for one of these to be zero and the product be non-zero. On the other hand, if these are both non-zero, then the product is non-zero. So we have an if and only if. The product of two complex numbers is, non, is non-zero if and only if the two individual factors are non-zero. It turns out that the analogous statement is true for non-singular. And that's this statement here. The product of non-singular matrices, the product of matrices is non-singular if and only if the individual matrices themselves are both non-singular. And actually the proof is going to be somewhat similar to the way you prove this. All right, now it's, this is set up this way. Uh, I prefer to organize this proof what, he's, what he essentially does here is he proves that, uh, first he proves that if B is singular, that means that A is singular. Okay, now this is not working, so I'm going to switch to the typewriter. All right, so he's going to prove this in two parts. He's going to prove B is singular implies AB is singular. And then he's going to prove A is singular, 
also implies AB is similar. Now, these two together imply the following statement. AB is non-singular implies both A and B non-singular. <clears throat> so how do you get this final statement from these two? Well, this is the contrapositive. AB is non-singular implies Let me say that again. AB is non-singular implies B is non-singular is the contrapositive of this statement. AB is non-singular implies A is, sing A is non-singular is the contrapositive of this statement. Okay, so from these two statements we can conclude this statement as a combination of the two contrapositives. All right, so let's do these two parts. First part, suppose B is singular if B is singular, then that means that we can find a Z such that BZ is equal to zero. Okay, That's the same thing as saying that Z is a solution to LS of B0. So we can find a Z that satisfies this. If so, then multiply AB times this Z and see what happens. AB times this Z, we can rearrange the multiplication to get A times BZ, but by hypothesis, BZ is zero. So we have a times 0 over 0. So what does this show us? This shows us that AB has a non-trivial null space. Okay. And if AB has a non-trivial null space, that means that AB is singular. So we know that AB is singular. Okay. So that's exactly what we wanted to show here. We're okay with this first part. Now for the second part, it's a little bit similar. Let's scroll down here and see the second part. Uh, we suppose that A is singular. Now, if A is singular, we can find a vector y such that's a solution to Ls of A0. So what does that mean? That means that we can find a y such that A, y equals 0. Okay. Now, that's not the same thing as A times B times y equals 0, which is what we want. We want to find a solution to AB times something is equal to zero. However, we can use this Y to find another vector. We know that since B is non-singular, then we want to solve B, we'll, we'll call the unknown vector W, is equal to Y. Okay. So we should be able to solve this equation if B is non-singular. That's one of the conditions of non-singular that we talked about earlier. Okay, So we can find a W such that BW is equal to Y. We know that A times Y is equal to 0. So following this argument, AB times W is A times BW. BW is Y, Y is 0, and we're done. The only thing we need to be concerned about is make sure that W is not 0. But W can't be 0 because B times 0 would be 0. That would mean that Y is 0, which doesn't, which is not true because we know that Y is a non-trivial solution. Okay? So just going back here, we've shown both of these things. If B is singular and AB is in singular, if A is singular, AB is singular. So the contrapositive of the combination of these two statements is AB non-singular implies both A and B are non-singular. Uh, the other way says that if A and B are both non-singular, then AB has to be non-singular. Right? Now, it's a similar argument. Uh, suppose that suppose that AB is so suppose we have a solution to this homogeneous equation, AB x is equal to zero, and we're going to show that x must itself be zero. Well, we can write AB x equals zero as zero equals A times BX. But now, since we know that A is non-singular, that means Bx must be zero. And since we know Bx is, B is non-singular, we know that we mean that X must be zero. So the only solution to the homogeneous equation is X is equal to zero. All right, so why is this theorem interesting? It's going to help us with our proofs with inverses. 
This theorem, which is also a kind of a lemma or helping theorem, says that one-sided inverse is sufficient. What does this mean? Suppose I have two square matrices such that AB equals I is the identity. Then BA is also the identity. Remember I mentioned before that we've already found a technique for finding the right inverse of a non-singular matrix. Right away, using this theorem, we can show it's also a left inverse. Okay? So how does this theorem go? Right. Well, this identity matrix is non-singular. So if we have two matrices that multiply to give the identity matrix, they must both be non-singular. So A and B are non-singular. In particular, B is non-singular, and we can use the method that I described before to find a right inverse for B. So we can find a C such that BC is equal to I. Now remember, what we want to show is that BA equals I. So start with BA, write that as BA times the identity, write the identity as B times C, rearrange the product, turn AB into the identity, and we get BC is equal to I. So this is just an algebraic proof that now the right inverse B also turns out to be a left inverse. Okay? So that gives us a big part of this, this theorem here, that uh, non-singular matrix is non-singular if and only if it's invertible. Because we've just seen now that if A is non-singular, we can find a right inverse. According to this theorem, the right inverse is also a left inverse. So A is non-singular means that A is invertible. On the other hand, if A is invertible, we can write uh, I as A times A inverse. And we have a, a non-singular matrix as the product of two matrices, so that we can conclude from that that A inverse is also non-singular. Okay, so we have this equivalent condition that I mentioned before. Then we also have this theorem that we mentioned before, that if you do have an invertible matrix and you want to solve the equation AX equals B, all you have to do is multiply both sides by A inverse, if you multiply the left side by A inverse on the left, you get X. If you multiply A inverse on the right, you get A inverse B. So uh, our solution to this equation is going to be A inverse B. And we know already that the solution is unique. So that gives us our unique solution. All right, I'm just going to briefly mention this section, unitary matrices, and just say the definition uh, a matrix is unitary if its adjoint is equal to its inverse. Okay, so if u is a square matrix such that u adjoint u is i, then we say u is unitary. So that means that u adjoint is the inverse of u. Now, if u is real, we have that u adjoint is equal to u transpose. Okay, so in the case of a real matrix, a real unitary matrix has U transpose times U as the identity. A real unitary matrix is also called an orthogonal matrix. Well, I'm not going to go past the definitions. When we end up using this, I'll come back later and talk about this.